sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour you'll find them at the back of the range and here's your host ben adelberg and welcome to the back of the range golf podcast i'm your host ben adelberg this is episode 108 Thanks to everyone that has spent the year listening to the podcast. I'm filling up the queue with more episodes, more videos, and more of everything, really. So going to make some very cool announcements soon about some more series projects throughout 2020. So if you liked the Road to Hoylake series that led up to the Walker Cup this year, you're going to get more of that next year. The Cyber Monday deal is still up on the website. If you didn't see the deal, you get a trucker hat of your choice, two towels, one for you and one for a friend and one of our custom logo metal ball markers. 25 bucks, so check out the website. It's thebackoftherange.com slash holiday deal. Go pick up some merch while everything is still in stock and get it done quick before I get out of here for the holidays. That way you can get it next week. Having said that, we just passed over 100 reviews in Apple Podcasts, which is incredible and very much appreciated. And I was planning on sending something special to the 100th review, But I didn't see any comments in the review or anything to let me know who left it. So let's try something different. Uh, See if I can get some holiday cheers sent out to you before Christmas. So if you're listening right now and you have not left a review, leave one and then shoot me an email with your contact information. I'll send you a towel. I'll send you something. Do it before Monday. My email address is ben at thebackoftherange.com. Hopefully that's simple enough. Get that done. I'll get some stuff out to you. Let's get started with this week's episode. We catch up this week with four-time PGA Tour winner and member of the Champions Tour, one of the most consistent players in the history of the PGA Tour, Bob Estes. So for those of you that follow the PGA Tour closely, you'll remember that Victor Hovland, former guest here, uh, national champion Oklahoma State, he set a new record by scoring in the 60s for 18 consecutive PGA Tour rounds. Whose record did he break? Well, that belonged to Bob Estes. He set that back in 2001. Bob played collegiately at the University of Texas. He racked up numerous honors and awards in his amateur career. 1988 was his year. No argument there. He won the Haskins. He won the Nicholas Award. He was the NCAA Player of the Year. And his final amateur tournament was the Texas State Amateur, which, of course, he won. We spoke about his early success as a professional He won his first pro tournament before getting to the PGA Tour, but once he got there, he won the Rookie of the Year. Other than time away from the game due to some injuries, he's basically been on tour for 30 consecutive years. Now, there's a lot of numbers I could throw at you about Bob's career, but the one that really stands out to me, he played over 650 PGA Tour events and made the cut about 70% of the time. Remarkable achievement. And how do you do it? Well, that's what we got into in this episode. We covered a lot of topics, probably needed some more time, but we chatted about the Champions Tour, Pro-Ams. Yeah, we're going to need to have Bob back on the podcast for a follow-up episode. But let's get the first installment out to you right now. Bob, thanks for joining me here at the back of the range. How are you? Oh, doing great. Looking forward to it, Ben. Well, let's start off with a simple one. Um, The name of the podcast is The Back of the Range. You've had this incredible career on the PGA Tour. You're a rookie in 89, so you you know what it's like to have longevity. What does your off-season look like? What does your practice routine in the off-season look like? Maybe now, uh, you know, possibly compared to what it was like um, when you're on the PGA Tour full-time. What does your off-season look like to get ready for, uh, for the season on the Champions Tour? Well, virtually every year, um, whether it was the PGA Tour or the Champions Tour, my main focus, since I only had about six to eight weeks, really, um, away from tournament golf, was training. So I have a great trainer here in Austin who was a world-class pole vaulter, and I'm still training year-round. I just can't do it, you know, quite as often or with as much intensity sometimes as um, I can in November and December and maybe part of January. Sure. So. My first tournament won't be until the second week of February in Naples, um, so I have even more time to train. So we're picking up the training a little bit here in the off season. I needed to get back a little bit more upper body strength for different reasons, hopefully to 
hit a little bit further and hopefully to, um, you know, be a little bit better at digging out of the rough and, you know, injury prevention and stuff like that. So I'm not getting crazy with it. Like sure. it sounds like Bryce and DeChambeau might be, <laughs> Man, but are you, are you um, reading, um, are you reading my notes? Cause you already talked about your <laughs> pole vaulting trainer, which I have to ask you how that happens. And then you talked about Bryson who, Bryson looks like he ate Bryson and became a bigger Bryson. So, yeah, so so you're going easy because you're just trying to do injury prevention but also pick up strength. I'm not going easy. I'm just not going as hard as Bryson. I've lifted heavy in the past okay. and, and got too big and too tight. And at some point, I had to back off of that. I knew I, I, I never was a great ball striker. I hit it pretty good at times. But I, I needed to try to figure out if I wasn't, swinging the club as well or hitting the ball as well as I thought I should and needed to because my swing wasn't good enough or because I was just a little bit too thick and tight through the chest and shoulders. And as it turns out, it was a combination of both. And so once I um, quit lifting quite as heavy and um, got a little bit more upper body mobility back, I was able to, um, you know, figure out that, yeah, my, my golf swing needed to, to change a little bit, too. So over the last five or six years, I um, strengthened my grip, and that helped me get a little bit um, more square as opposed to open um, with my shoulders and forearms and address. And so then I was able to swing the club a little bit um, better and more freely and hit it you know, straighter as opposed to hitting big cuts like I, I used to. Yeah. Boy, we're going to jump around because just by you saying that opened up a, another question. Before we talk about your start, and you know, I want to hit on a little bit of your career at the University of Texas, one of the most prolific careers in, in college golf. Which I'm not sure how many people know what you did in college, so we're definitely going to hit on that. But, but you just brought this up of trying to hit it farther and getting stronger. You know, you had this great amateur career, this great collegiate career. You were rookie of the year on the PGA Tour. Uh, was it a challenge for you to kind of stay in your lane as far as like, hey, this is what has taken me this far. I know I can be successful. But when you get out on tour and you see different swings and you see different instructors, other people surpassing you or different, is it hard? Was it hard for you to just kind of stick to what you knew and ignore the noise of, oh, I need to get, I need to do this. I need to switch to these set of irons. How, how is this professional to try and stay focused on what has worked for you in the past? Well, when I first um, got out on tour, I mean, I, you know, and, and I wouldn't say that, you know, I was a world beater by any means. I mean, golf was never that easy for me. I worked really hard at it. Right. And, um, you know, had a, a pretty decent record coming out of college in amateur golf. But there were still plenty of guys that beat up on me all the time. And we can talk about a few of those guys later if you want to. But <laughs> anyway, okay. but as far as um, when I first got out on tour, one thing that I quickly realized was that I, I didn't hit the ball well enough. I usually survived by just keeping the ball in play for the most part. And then I had one of the best short games in the world, um, you know, at that time and, and throughout most of my career. Um, if you look at the statistics, um, my best statistic was almost always scrambling, and that's also why I was able to stay on tour for so long because sure. I never hit it quite as good as I needed to be one of the very best players in the world. Um, and so I was searching and working on things all the time, making equipment changes as I thought I needed to to improve my ball striking, work with different teachers, not a lot of teachers, but you know some. And... Um, it just never, never quite worked out. It never quite got to the point where I hit it um, as good as I felt like I should until that stretch in um, 2001 um, through part of 2003, maybe when I went to a 10 finger grip or a baseball grip. And I did win three times in a 13 month stretch and also won the fall finish one of those um, years. And, um, so, so I, I got to the point where I was hitting it pretty good, but I was kind of limited because I couldn't hit it quite as far as I felt like I needed to, to really keep up and compete. Um, so that was something I maybe shouldn't have gotten away from. And I actually could be getting back to it here during this off season. So we'll see how it goes. There you go. 
Well, I, you know, like I mentioned, you, know, you played at the University of Texas, you know, three-time All-American, your 88 Player of the Year, won the Nicholas uh, Award, won the Haskins Award, uh, you know, won a state amateur championship uh, at, at Texas. And, well, here, I have a, I have a few questions for you as far, as far as your collegiate career and amateur career. So you have these amateur wins and you have these collegiate wins. I'm just curious, I was the U.S. Amateur or Walker Cup on your radar any of those years? Um, you know, you can you can make an argument that in 88 you're the best player in college golf. I know that was kind of the middle year between, you know, the, the Sunningdale Walker Cup in 87 and Peachtree in Georgia in, in 89. Can you – do you have any recollection of what that was like as far as Walker Cup or, or U.S. Amateur around that time? Well, of course, I would have loved to have played – you know, in the Walker Cup, and I played a couple of U.S. Ams. Yeah. I got beat by Burr Plank in the second round the year that he won at Oak Tree at his home club while he was there in college. But, um, you know, Walker Cup was something that, that would have been incredible to, to be a part of. But my main goal all along, uh, besides winning the NCAA championship as a team and an individual, was to go straight from college to the PGA Tour. And I did do that. So, no, after um, the NCAA, my senior year in June of 88, I played the Texas State Amateur a week or two later, and I won that finally. Um, so that was a big win. So that was that was my last amateur tournament. And then I think the very next week, I played my very first professional tournament in Missouri, the Bogey Hills Invitational, Bogey Hills, yeah. which was the biggest mini-tour tournament at the time, and I won that. So my very first week as a professional, I won – that tournament and won forty thousand dollars, and so I got off to a great start. <laughs> and um, and during that same time frame, that summer and um, fall, I played in some state opens, you know, some other mini tour events. I got five invites to play in PGA Tour events while I was going through the qualifying process, and I had to go through three stages. There were three stages back then. I think there's four now. Um, I'm not, I'm not for sure about that. that no, that's you're right. It's, well, it's, well, it's pre-Q. I know yeah, the qualifying pre- is basically, you know, for the um, the uh, corn fairy, fairy tour. Yeah. But anyway, I had to go through all three stages back then, and I I made it through, tied for I think 32nd or fifth or something at the the final stage out in um, Palm Desert, and went straight to the tour. So um, my rookie year was 1989. Yeah. You know, we're recording this the week, um, you know, in a few days, the uh, Q School finals are going to start for Corn Ferry Tour uh, down here in uh, South Florida, actually in Central uh, Winter Garden, Florida, or Orange County National. Uh, you mentioned, you know, you, you know, being a rookie there in 89. I know you had to go back to Q School just a couple times, but I'm just curious, do you have any thoughts uh, on, you know, what qualifying for the PJ Tour looked like uh, back then for you, where, you know, once a year you go to this, this one Q school and that gets you right back onto the PJ tour. Now it's Q school can only get you to the corn Ferry tour. And then you have PJ tour, Canada, you have the Kenzie tour and Latin America and China, all these, all these developmental tours, you know, there's more places to play, but there's less money to make on those tours. Uh, I mean, if you were starting out right now, how, how much harder would it be starting out now compared to perhaps having that one, jump from q school that takes you to the pga tour well it may depend on how you mean that because you know the, there are so many great players now you know coming out of college or uh, from academies you know or all around the world so um as far as the the depth of um players it, it's probably you know it's, it's only going to get tougher it's probably mm-hmm. as tough as it's ever been but um I know when they uh, made that announcement many years ago that qualifying school was not going to get you directly to the PGA Tour, but to the, you know, buy.com or web.com or whatever it was at the time, um, a lot of people didn't necessarily agree with that. Um, you know, some players probably need that time, and they've admitted it on the secondary tour, um, but others were, you know, good enough to go straight to the PGA Tour without, you know, needing a year on the, the tour below the PGA Tour. So um, really, it was just kind of an individual thing. It wasn't necessarily good or bad. Um, and then, obviously, players sometimes play those um, a few events that they're allowed to play in, like Jordan Speed, and uh, make enough money or even win and go straight to the PGA Tour. So um, 
yeah, there's there's different ways to do it, but the uh, the quality of play is just getting better and better. You uh, you mentioned Spieth. I know we've talked about Texas. Uh, so many great players coming out of the University of Texas. Whether it's him, whether it's uh, you know Justin Leonard and Brad Elder, and obviously uh, Kite and Crenshaw, uh, just legends. I'm just uh, I'm just curious how much uh, how much interaction do you have or have you had with the uh, with the Texas golf team? Uh, you know, since becoming professional, I know you're big Texas guy and, and just curious, like what's, do you go back to, to visit with the teams or what's been your uh, interaction with Texas golf? Well, I do some, not as much as I would have liked. Um, part of, you know, I, uh, I'm a member here at Austin country club. I'm also an honorary member at the UT golf club, member at the Austin golf club. So I have different places to, to play and practice when I'm in town. And I haven't spent as much time at the UT golf club as I probably would have liked getting to know, you know, more of the players better over the years. Uh, you know, I've, I've met a lot of them, chatted with a lot of them at different times, but yeah, I haven't spent as much time with them as I would have liked. And part of that is, well, don't forget, I, I, I did have a, you know, a, a stretch where I was injured for quite a while, but um, in other times I wasn't spending as much time in Austin, but um yeah, it would, it would have been nice to um, spend a little bit more time with them. I mean, I have spoken to the team a couple of different times, played in many of the, the fundraiser golf um, tournaments that helped build the academy sure. for the teams, men's and women's, at the UT Golf Club. So, um, yeah, that is one thing I kind of regret is not having spent a little bit more time with them, but I struggle so much with my game and my equipment in particular that um, I, I, I spent a lot of time just – going back and forth from working on clubs to hitting balls and trying to um, trying to learn how to swing the club better and hit the ball better and not spending as much time as I would have liked actually playing golf and maybe playing with more of the members on both teams. I saw a picture, I think it was in Golf Magazine or Golf Digest, it looked like it was the Texas team uh, getting on a private jet. It was Cole Hammer and the, the Cootie Boys and uh, – you know, a couple of the other guys are getting on this private jet to go to a golf tournament. How many private jet rides were you taking when you were a member of the Longhorn team back in the 80s? It seems like we did take just a few, but not many. Okay. Um, usually, yeah, usually we were just, you know, either driving the tournaments. Um, yeah, our, our schedule wasn't nearly as good uh, back then as what the teams had played recently. Yeah. Um, we, we played, you know, more tournaments in Texas. And we usually would go to some, some nice tournaments, whether it was a preview tournament for the NCAA, wherever that was, in California or Ohio or wherever. Um, and I uh, remember, yeah, in Florida, I remember playing Greenleaf. Oh, um, wow. Prior I, to the I NCAA Green, tournament. I played a tournament at Greenleaf. <laughs> my, story's uh, probably, pro, my story's probably not as good as yours. but uh, Well, I don't have a story as much as I remember being really hard. So... <laughs> Um, but I think that was the fall of my um, freshman year when I maybe played that and then um, at the NCAA tournament. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a hard course. But, um, yeah, we, um, we had, we had a, a nice schedule, but, um, yeah, we, and we didn't take a couple of great trips as a team. One was a tournament in Japan and one was just a golf trip to, um, to Scotland to play a lot of the courses over there, which yeah. teams were allowed to do once every four years. So, so that was incredible. Got to do that. But yeah, we had a, we had, we had two of our own tournaments here in Austin, um, one in the spring and one in the fall. And I remember going to to Houston to play and Beaumont and Fort Worth and um, up to Dallas at least for the Southwest Conference one year. But um, yeah, they 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 play a, a pretty incredible schedule now. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, they're uh, they're jet setting and flying all over the place. So I, I want to ask you, I, I read a quote that you provided, and it's kind of stuck with me since just kind of getting set up for our conversation today. But um, you made this this comment that you, you didn't really learn how to practice and prepare yourself until you got on tour. Can you explain kind of what you were, what you're kind of alluding to there is like, I guess, how did you learn how to become a professional? It's so one thing about dreaming to be on the PGA Tour, dreaming to win titles, but I don't know how many people necessarily, you know, young kids, college players are dreaming about a job and what goes into becoming a professional. Can you maybe speak to, to how you learned how to do that? Yeah, and I can't remember exactly, you know, what I said in that quote because I was always a hard worker. Right. 
I played other sports growing up. I played high school basketball or basketball up through high school. So I, I definitely learned what hard work was all about then. <laughs> but, but, you know, but I was also, um, you know, pretty much addicted to golf as well. And so I, um, I was always, always practicing, you know, really hard because I was six months basketball, six months golf, a little bit of overlap on both sides. So I was always having to play catch up, you know, with my teammates and, um, and then in college, um, you know, I continued that, but then I kind of got burned out my sophomore year. So, um, yeah, there, there's different things that you learn over time. Um, sometimes I spent maybe too much time practicing out of the sand. I mean, I'm, I might go in the bunker as obsessed as I was with golf. I might go hit bunker shots for two hours, but then I then maybe go to the, the driving range to hit balls, and all I could do was hit, you know, pull cuts or slices. So I, yeah. uh, at some point, I finally learned that, um, you know, I don't need to spend that much time in the bunker consecutively, especially if I'm about to go, you know, hit balls and work on my swing a little bit. So um, and at times, I, I practice too hard, especially after a round on tour. And at times, I, I train too hard during a tournament. So all of that stuff is, is very individualistic, and you have to, to learn you know, what is best for you? Cause it's not always the same for every player. Yeah. You, you mentioned just being so driven and so devoted to it. And I think a lot of people are, it seems like part of the culture now on the PGA tour is talking about camaraderie and, and uh, you know, maybe these guys are a little bit closer and they're all rooting for each other. I'm just curious when you got on tour, what were you overly concerned with anyone else? Were you, uh, looking to, were you traveling with a certain set of guys? Were there people that were friends? And, or, or, you know, what was kind of the, your, I guess, approach to it? Was it just, I'm putting my head down. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make a paycheck or I'm here to further my career. This is just curious, maybe what your approach to it was. Well, I certainly was. And I don't mean, I don't, and I don't mean, pay, I'm sorry. I, let me rephrase. I don't mean paycheck as I'm not trying to win. I just, but like, I'm looking at it as like, this is a career, this is a job. I didn't, um, let me rephrase that. Oh, no, I was thinking more of um, what you, you said about um, other players on tour. Okay. Um, when I qualified for the tour, there were only two other players um, who went directly from college to the PGA Tour, as I did. And those two were Billy Mayfair, who played at Arizona State, and Larry Silvera, who played at Arizona. Yeah. So a lot of, and, and a lot of my friends over the next you know, couple of years um, never made it to the tour. So I didn't really have any close friends um, or ex-teammates that were that were playing the tour, um, you know, most of my career. So, I mean, I was friendly with a lot of guys, and there's a lot of amazing guys. Um, they're just super, you know, super nice, um, great guys. Um, and so, but but not that I was, you know, best friends with, with any of them. I was, I was still pretty much doing my own thing and just yeah. trying to um, get as good as I could as quickly as I could. Um, but, you know, as far as, say, for instance, playing practice rounds, I pretty much play a practice round with, with anybody or anybody that would play along with me. So a lot of times you just kind of show up to the tee and whoever's there, you all just hit it and go. And then, you know, that's how you get to know some players better as well and caddies. Sure. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's different, again, for just about every player out there because some of them um, maybe were teammates in college or some of them maybe their wives are best friends and they become best friends. And so, you know, that's just kind of how some of that stuff evolves. You mentioned practice rounds. Uh, I am <laughs> I mean, that's that's probably the work of it. Getting out to go play the term is actually the, the you know, you can stop working and just go execute there. But along with practice rounds, you have the pro-am rounds. And, I mean, you've played in over 650 PGA Tour events, and I can't even fathom how many pro-am rounds you've played in and all the characters you've seen. I mean, we could fill up an entire other episode with just pro-am stories, I could imagine. But um, We probably could. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to put you through that torture, but how, how did you approach program rounds where you could at least get something out of it for your own game, but also provide a good experience for the amateurs that have paid to be in the pro-am 
Did you have a kind of rule of thumb for how you approach those days? And then after that, I'll definitely at least ask you for one good pro am story. You got to have at least one good one. Okay, I think I have a few, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, for the most part, from the very beginning, understood the importance of the pro am rounds. Right. And a lot of times, it's not that the the guys don't enjoy playing the pro am rounds. It's just how long they take. Of and a lot of the amateurs get frustrated as well with how long they take because a lot of times we just have too many people on the golf course at one time. But um, but I always tried to, um, you know, be very nice to, you know, the, the amateurs that were paying the money or they were clients of other um, people putting up the money. Sure. Um, so my caddy and I, no matter who my caddy was, I usually had great caddies that were very friendly and very helpful. So, yeah, so we tried to to be as, um, you know, courteous and friendly and helpful as we, we could be to the amateurs. Because, um, we, we, you know, we also know how, how much they appreciated that. And, um, you know, and that's kind of what they would expect, too. So, um, yeah, I just, I just, you know, at times I was I was able to, help some of the amateurs with their games and help them play better immediately. Or I would offer advice or suggest advice, you know, for them to maybe work on after the, after the round, you know, in the future, you know, or just ask them questions about, you know, who they work with or what they're working on or have they ever worked with a teacher, things like that. Um, you know, and also just try to make them, understand that um, they don't need to stress out too much about how they play that we right. pretty much have already seen it all <laughs> you yeah. know playing in as many pro as we played yeah they don't need and, to try and um, press you so so a lot of times yeah they, they talk about you know especially if it's the first time they've ever played a pro and then on tour and they they hit that first tee shot and maybe they don't hit it very good and and then they admit that's the most nervous they've ever been um, <laughs> on the first tee or hitting a shot or whatever. So we get to kind of joke and laugh about that, but, you know, try to calm them down and, you know, whatever way, you know, seems to work the best. So, yeah, so it's, um, I, we, and, and actually kind of changing up just a little bit. No, um, this, this year in particular, um, for the last, you know, virtually all year long on the on the Champions Tour, uh, we you meet all kinds, um, you know, of, of amateurs. Some that are you know great players, some that never play, some that um, can be a little bit you know obnoxious, <laughs> just like we can be at times. Of course. Um, or um, or um, or the amateur that's in your hip pocket all day long and. Um, just um you know just machine guns questions at you from, <laughs> from start to start to finish but um now i've kind of lost track of what i was going to tell you but um well let, yeah we, well, well, we've I'm, had a lot of uh, a lot of oh and i was going to say we, we we've had we, we played we met so many great people uh my caddy and i uh during the programs this year sometimes we played one sometimes we played two the way the the, the champions tour is, is set up sure. and we just met so many great people um this year playing in the pro-ams it was it was just kind of fascinating and you know my, my caddy was having a little bit of a health issue um during the summertime and we um we, we we played with a group of doctors and this one doctor is still you know kind of checking up on him to make sure everything is good and that's awesome but, but that but the, the very next morning after the pro-am um he was able to go get a checkup the doctor got him right in immediately to go get a checkup. And, um, you know, it's just kind of a temporary thing. But um, anyway, so stuff like that. So, we, yeah, we need a lot of really um, great people, men and women. So, Well, I would also imagine that you would be, and the more I think about it, is you, you would probably be one of the best draws for a pro-am because – Ultimately, I'm guessing your your message to them is, look, this is how I've done it. I've worked really hard to get where I'm at and to stay on the PGA Tour, Champions Tour, whatever whatever tour you're, whatever the program is. But there's no secret pill I can give you. There isn't some secret of the pros that I know about that you're never going to know about. I just work really hard at this, and that's something that they could really take away 
uh, and, and put into their own games. Now, they may never get to the level where they're a scratch or they're playing on the, on the PGA Tour, but hey, if they can shave three, four shots off their game, and also I'm sure that you work tons with them with a you know, short game and also uh, being a great win player. I mean, being from you know Texas, you got to be a great win player. So I would guess you'd have tons of things to communicate. So those are the positives, but but or those are the the great things you've been able to communicate. But but let me ask you, what's the pro am round that just sticks out that like man, only in a pro am would this story ever happen? Well, I mean, you know, we we've seen just about everything, like I mentioned earlier. I mean, I've seen them go straight sideways. I've seen them hit them between their legs. I've seen them hit a shot that maybe hit the ball washer or a curb or something, and went you know, back behind us. So we would pretty much seen it all. But one thing that always stands out that I'll never forget, we were playing a pro am in um, Greensboro uh, at Forest Oaks. Um, the venue has changed, you know, since then, of course, sure. that was many years ago, but and I think it was a Monday pro am. I don't think it, it wasn't the Wednesday pro am. I think it was a Monday pro am that I'd agreed to play in. And um, we were playing with a bunch of, um, I think, NASCAR truck series drivers. Oh, nice. And so, um, and I did get to drive on the Charlotte Motor Speedway the very next day, but that's just kind of, yeah, that was kind of a part of the deal. But back to, to Monday, um, we, were, we were warming up for the round, and the weather was really nice. And then as soon as we got out to our hole, it was a shotgun start. So as soon as we got out to the hole, we were going to start, it began to rain. And the, the NASCAR truck driver that I was playing with, I'm pretty sure he had never played golf. I think that's, I think that's what they were saying. So, you know, he had, you know, a, a bag of clubs that were not very good and um, not even sure if they were his. But we get on the first tee, and I, I, didn't, I don't remember seeing him hit any on the, um, on the driving range. But then we get on the first tee, all of a sudden it starts to pour, and he doesn't have a glove. And so when it's his turn to hit, you know, he, he swings and the club came flying out of his hands and went high and up to the left into a tree. There was a big tree in front of that tee and to the left. And so the club came flying out of his hands and went up in the tree and got stuck in the tree. And I don't know if anybody ever was able to retrieve it, but that's a, that's a shot I'll never forget. Sounds <laughs> like it. So that was that. That was pretty interesting. I'm sure he was very embarrassed, but like I said, it was pouring rain, and he didn't have a glove on, and the grips were probably pretty slick, and it just came flying out of his hands. Wow. And then um, earlier this um, this year, I guess it was in um, September. I think it's when we played at the Good Sporting Goods Open in New York. I had um, an Amber team of um, three men and one lady, and this one particular guy who wasn't the best player on our team and it wasn't really his fault because you know a lot of times when you, when you tee off you're everybody's kind of going to their balls and trying to find their tee shots and stuff sure. like that but three times during that round the same guy almost hit the lady in our group with his with his next shot you know one of those actually hit the cart while she was sitting in it, and the other two times almost hit her while she was out walking around. And a lot of times they thought they, they weren't um, even close to the line of play necessarily. But like I said, he, he wasn't very good. And um, But three times she almost got hit, so that was kind of bizarre. So, yeah, we, we, we see a lot, of, a lot of interesting things on um, on Wednesdays and Thursdays now in the pro am So oh, I, I, can, I can only imagine and then <laughs> – I, I can imagine it's probably not going to change anytime soon. Um, you're talking about the Champions Tour. Uh, you had a major medical exemption in 17 and 18 on, on the regular tour, so you had a handful of events to play in, and and then also splitting time between the, the Champions Tour. You know, we see all those really super low scores, and people think that, okay, well, they just set the course up super easy. Um, totally not the case. It's just everyone out there is just so incredible. Uh, what was your first reaction or, or, you know, when you're 48, 49 years old, what was your first kind of thoughts about playing in the Champions Tour? Was it something that, you know, completely different to you or was just going back to see guys you played the regular tour with? I'm actually very fascinated with the Champions Tour. I'd like to see it get bigger and bigger like, like it was during the days of, you know, Nicholas and, and Palmer and Trevino. Um, talk to me a little bit about your experience on the Champions Tour when you first started out. 
the, the quality of play on the Champions Tour is better than what people realize. Right. And um, as far as getting bigger and better, that has pretty much everything to do with, you know, the most successful players from their PGA Tour days, European Tour days, committing to play on the Champions Tour or, you know, a fair number of tournaments on the Champions Tour. Just like Ernie Els is planning on playing, I think, a pretty pretty full schedule on the, the Champions Tour um, this next year. He's already turned 50, but he turned 50 at the very end of the season, so he wasn't able to play an event yet. Right. But with Keith Lucen is, you know, playing full time on the Champions Tour. Um, obviously, Bernhard Longer um, for a couple's plays when his back feels good. Tom Watson is, you know, continued to play. You know, he's not playing as much the last few years, but you know, it has a lot to do with, um, you know, the, the bigger names. Yeah. So we'll, you know, we'll see if and when Phil um, plays some on the Champions Tour. I can see him playing a few of the, the senior majors in particular, not necessarily. 2020 but maybe after that so um so we'll see but um but yeah it's, it's getting more and more competitive um let me mention this right quick because you, you talked about me playing on both tours in 17 and 18 and on um, 2017 my last event that year on the regular tour was the Wyndham at Sedgefield great golf course fun to play everybody loves playing it um, it's not necessarily hard, not necessarily easy, but, um, so I played that event. I think I, uh, I think I missed the cut by a couple of shots, but you know, I played okay, but not good enough. And then the very next week I go to, um, Seattle, the Seattle area to play in the Boeing. And so I played that event and the, the, the setup and the course at the Boeing were more difficult on the champions tour than they were the prior week on the regular tour at Sedgefield. So after I played another tournament or two on the, well, I think it was that, yeah, maybe it was the next week. I can't remember, but I was asking some of the guys, I was like, are, um, are the, are the courses always, <laughs> you know, set up as difficult on the champions tour. And they told me that in the last year and a half or so, which would take us back to the beginning of 2016, that that's when they started setting them up longer and tougher because except for maybe just a little bit of length, the, you know, the, they get the greens just as firm um, and fast as on the regular tours. So um, there's not that much difference from the champions tour setups to the regular tour setups, except for, you know, maybe a little bit of length um, most weeks. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a great tour and love and playing it. Is there anything, and uh, I mean, you, you already hit on on Phil, um, you know, whether he's going to play or not. Is there anything that, not not to be critical of the tour, but is there anything that you would like to see potentially changed or or um, accentuated to maybe draw more attention, whether it's in fan attendance? Because, again, you have, you know, all these established players. Everyone really knows the names. You have longstanding relationships with with sponsors and with with different, um, you know, with the galleries, you know, is there anything that maybe you think it can be done to, to boost it, or is it really just predicated on the bigger names playing on that tour? I think for the most part, it just has to do with more of the bigger names playing. I mean, okay. can you imagine some of the guys that could be playing right now that aren't and how many more people would come out to watch? Yeah. I mean, certain tournaments that, that we play, the attendance is incredible. Um, we play in a lot of golf star communities, you know, like the, the newer events um, that we have in South Dakota. You know, people come out by the tens of thousands, um, even in not so good weather sometimes. So um, there's, I, I guess, um, a lot of the talk at times is about the, the cities or the areas that we don't play in when maybe we could be playing, you know, in those particular um cities that the PGA Tour does not play in. But as I say that, we have 27 tournaments right now currently on the schedule. And if if that went to, you know, 32 or 35 or whatever, like more like it used to be on the Champions Tour, are, are the guys, you know, willing to play that many weeks? Because the way the schedule is right now, we have the built-in off weeks. Sure. And so, so you know, it's just about right as far as how many tournaments guys want to play over the, the course of the year. And so, most weeks you get most of the best players playing. And if you if you added tournaments, um, you know, that would get diluted somewhat. So, um, 
you know, as things go and as business goes, you know, we're going to, you know, at times, you know, lose a sponsor or two and lose a tournament or two. And then, you know, they're always looking to replace those. And so then we may end up going to some of those places that we don't currently play that would love to have a, a Champions Tour event if they weren't going to get a PJ Tour event. So, so we'll see how that goes over the next few years. Yeah, I, I was speaking with uh, with a previous guest about uh, the Canadian Tour, and he was telling me how, yeah, uh, the McKenzie Tour, the, the fans would come out because that, you know, they just don't get golf uh, as much in that area, and they you would just get huge, huge uh, crowds on uh, on Canadian Tour events. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It'd be interesting to have some of these tournaments at, at places that don't normally see uh, tournament golf. But um, And we do play in Calgary, don't forget. Oh, so yeah. We get great crowds. Um, in Calgary, lots of people come out to watch. So, you know, they, they look forward to that and we do too. So, um, but, but that is, you know, a good example. There's other places, <laughs> you know, Canada is a, a giant country. There's, you know, we, we could be playing in other, um, cities in, um, in Canada as well. Um, but there's, there's plenty of areas in the U S that we don't hit either that maybe we could and maybe we will in the future. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to, you've been very gracious with your time. I just want to get you out of here on one thing. You know, you're from Texas, so used to playing in the wind. I know that one of your, um, you know, of all the tournaments that you've played in, I know that, that you're a big fan of playing in the Open Championship. I know that was one of your favorite majors that you've played in. Um, just kind of curious for people listening that are always trying to improve their game and knock uh, some shots off their uh, handicap, you know. Maybe they're not used to playing in high wind conditions. Maybe what are some of the key fundamentals that you try and keep in, in mind when trying to play in the wind? And then uh, if if you can, you know, maybe what's one of the worst conditions or what are some of the worst conditions you ever played in as far as wind? <laughs> you, gave, you gave me a lot to think about there, especially as much as I've played in the wind. And, I know. Um, all the different opens that I've played in and things like that. But um, actually one of the, the worst conditions that I ever played in was when I was in high school. I was a sophomore in high school um, in Abilene, Texas, and I think there were five different cities and maybe seven or eight schools um, um, in our district, and one of our district rounds was in Odessa, Texas, at Odessa Country Club. And so we're playing our, our team golf, mainly you know, our district, regional, and state in the, in the spring, and that's when it can get really, really windy in Texas, as most people know. And so we were playing um, that particular day when the, the wind was gusting up to 60 miles an hour. And I mean, it was already howling um, that morning as we were, um, you know, getting ready to play. And there was a real, my dad, to uh, mention that, my dad was our high school golf coach. Okay. Uh, he was also a football, basketball coach as well. But then um, he, uh, he was a golf coach as well at McMurray before he got the golf coaching job at Evelyn Cooper where I played. So anyway, so if any one of the, the coaches decided that we were going to play on a particular day, we would have to play. And it was so bad. Don't forget how dusty it is out in West Texas. So the, the dust is flying. You know, I'm sure tree branches were coming down. But my dad knew that we had the best team and that we would deal with it the best. So my dad voted um, for us to play even though all the other coaches voted um, not to play. <laughs> so we played that round, and um, it was it was awful. I had dust in my eyes. Um, I remember actually being over against the fence on a par five that goes along the road or the highway there, and I got hit from behind by a tumbleweed that, that actually knocked me to my knees. But I was tall and skinny back then, don't forget. So, um, not much resistance on my part, but, um, that was, that was one of the most unbelievable rounds. I think I shot in the, um, probably low to mid nineties that day. And then one of my teammates who played at Stanford, Cole Thompson shot 76 in those conditions. And it was one of the best rounds of golf I've ever, I didn't see it of course, cause I was playing, but one of the best um, rounds of golf I've ever heard of. But, um, that's how good our high school golf team was back then too. But as far as playing in the wind, um, you know, spin can be very dangerous and launching the ball too high. Not as good to do it now since the balls don't um, curve quite as much as they did. But, um, you know, you all, most everybody that plays golf has heard the, you know, the saying, you know, when 
and you know, when it gets breezy, you swing easy, mm-hmm. and you know, you can take that too far and swing too easy, of course, and drift the club too lightly. But, um, but yeah, but you obviously, unless you're playing over a, a hazard or something like that, you know, it's best to, to, to grip down and take more club and, um, and swing a little, um, smoother, I guess, because you're, you're trying to impart less spin on the ball, especially, um, end of the wind. So, um, it's also good to be able to move the ball right to left and left to right. If you're that advanced, um, to, to counter crosswinds, if that's what you need to do on a particular hole, a particular shot. So, um, yeah, there's, there's lots to, lots to play in the wind. And it seems like every time it gets windy, we, we kind of have to, um, relearn, some things and, and adjust. It, that doesn't just automatically happen as soon as it starts blowing 30 or 40 miles an hour again. Definitely some good advice there and, and obviously a lot of experience on your side. Um, well, Bob, I really appreciate you joining me this week here at the back of the range. Just fascinating to listen to you after your, your illustrious career still continuing on the Champions Tour. Uh, I'll be seeing you hopefully at the Oasis and hopefully at the, uh, at the Chubb in Naples in February. And uh, hopefully we can catch up again soon. Thanks for joining me here at the back of the range. Okay, you're welcome. It's been fun. And there you have it. Special thanks to Bob Estes for joining us this week at the back of the range. Don't forget, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Every episode is available at thebackoftherange.com. You know about our holiday deal. You know about our free towel Tuesdays. So make sure you're following along on social media. We'll see you again next week for another episode here at the back of the range.